progress. But how will we know how the answers transform them? Okay, all right. So, no, I really do have a lot to get through. Um, we have we have other things to go on. Okay, so um, so for many of you who are familiar with tensors and index notation from GR or other contexts, the last lecture was probably something of review. For those of you who have not seen it before, um, uh, I know it's pretty intimidating the first time, so I'm going to just back up for a moment and kind of. Uh, reiterate some very important observations about some, a few of the things that I wrote on the board last time. Um, so, <coughs> we have seen uh, several indexed quantities. These are things that have uh, subscripts, superscripts, and we use the Einstein summation convention to evaluate them. But I kind of want to remind you of the different <laughs> varieties of these things that we've seen. So the first category are these things we would call tensors. And um, tensors in this class are going to represent essentially all kinematic uh, and dynamical quantities. So if you will, these are going to be uh, the degrees of freedom that we study. Uh, so, for example, you know, velocity is eventually going to be written as a tensor, uh, but also things like the electromagnetic field strength is going to be written as a tensor. All of the fields that go into the Lagrangian are going to be some kind of tensor fields with the exception of most of them. Uh, that's because they're going to be spinner fields, but more on that later. Um, but anyway, so, and we talked about how last time a general tensor, we could call a PQ tensor, where the P is the number of upper indices, and this is the number, Q is the number of lower indices. And the really nice thing about working with general tensors after you've put in a lot of mileage into defining vectors and dual vectors is that a tensor is really not much more than a collection of vector and dual vector indices. Um, and the, you know, so we could write a general tensor, mu, nu, lambda, beta, gamma, alpha, if you will. And so this would be a tensor that has three vector indices and three dual vector indices. And based on that identification, we could immediately write down, for example, the transformation law of this tensor. Because as we talked about last time, if you do a transformation, you just put down a transformation matrix for each vector index and then a transformation matrix for each dual vector index and you use the appropriate transformation for each one. Um, now, there's something else that we can do with tensors which we didn't talk about last time and that is we can contract tensors to form other tensors and we do that in the following, in the following way. So for example, we could have a, a dual vector V lower mu and we could combine it with a 2, 0 tensor T mu nu. And in the process of doing that, uh, using the summation convention, the two mu indices would disappear because you would sum over it. And so really, if I kind of just stood back and squinted my eyes and said, how many real honest to God indices does this thing actually have? The answer would be one, and it would be a upper index. So really, I could call this a new tensor G nu, okay? And here's the cool thing. This actually transforms like a vector because if we tried to transform it like this, we would use a matrix that looks like this for V mu, V mu prime mu, no, that's not it. V, uh, lambda mu mu prime V mu, and then we would also use a matrix for this guy that would look like this. And then another one to transform that new. Okay, so if I wanted to transform from the mu, new coordinates to new, to, to <laughs> NEW, mu prime, new prime coordinates, this is the transformation I would use. But what happens to those two things? They go. Why? Yeah, yeah, this is the inverse of this. So secretly, this thing would just disappear, and really this whole object would just transform with that one lambda, which is how a vector transforms. 
Okay. So we can combine tensors uh, into to form other tensors using summation. Of course, we don't have to sum over an index. We could just make this a different index. All right, and then this would be a single tensor, which would actually have three indices. Okay. So making the index the same is a very produces a very different beast than if you keep it different. All right. Okay. So, um, of course, there's a small category of tensors that we can represent as matrices. We know that dual vectors we can represent as row matrices, vectors we can represent as column matrices, and then a second rank tensor we can represent as a square matrix. But it automatically gets a little confusing because there are actually lots of second rank tensors. Anything with two indices you can represent as a square matrix. If one index is the row, one index is the column. But you know, if I just gave you a matrix, would you know if it was this versus this versus this versus this? Does it matter? Well, hell yes, it matters because these objects all transform differently. Okay? So giving you a matrix is not enough to tell you what kind of tensor it is. I really need to give you the array of values and tell you where the indices sit. Because you have to know how it transforms, otherwise it's useless. Okay, so this idea that some folks that teach in this department espouse <laughs> that a second rank tensor is just a matrix is categorically wrong. Because if I give you a matrix, that does not tell you what type of tensor it is. The two things can't be tantamount to one another, okay? so. But nonetheless, we can represent them by matrices, and we can do some ma manipulations with matrix multiplication, and we'll come back to uh, how we actually implement that in a few minutes. But, but in general, as soon as you get beyond two indices, you can't even write it as a square matrix, so matrix operations are out the door. So we really are gonna rely on these index manipulations. Okay, so um, the second point that I wanna make is that in this uh, wild and wacky world of tensors of all sorts, there is one tensor which is special. And that is the tensor we call the metric. <coughs> and we call the metric tensor generically G mu nu, although in special relativity, which is of course the context that we'll be dealing with in this class, we often call it eta mu nu. Okay. In general relativity, which is a, a subject where you're looking at arbitrary metrics, in fact, you're, you're finding the metric as a solution to the Einstein equations of motion, um, you just give it a generic label, and then you find its specific form. But special relativity, we always have a set form of the metric, so we just give it a special name, A to B and M. Uh, I'll sort of interchange these, but since we're always working with special relativity, it's always going to have that minus one, 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 one form. Um, now, the, the metric is a special tensor because one of the things that we can do with a metric is we can use a metric to take a vector and create from it the corresponding components of the, or the components of the corresponding dual vector, okay? Now, I want to I wanna point out something very important. I could take any tensor with two lower indices and combine it with a vector. And by virtue of the fact that these are repeated, this would give me something with a lower index. However, I have no business calling that the dual vector V. I should really give it a totally different name. If you think about it, we have the set of vectors on a space and for each and every vector on that space, there is a corresponding dual vector in the set of dual vectors. Okay, so it's like a little population of blue Smurfs and a little population of red Smurfs, and there's an isomorphism from each blue Smurf to each corresponding red Smurf, and that map is exactly what the metric knows, okay? This is a different map. This is taking like Papa Blue Smurf and turn, turning him into Red Smurfette. <laughs> okay? Which is not the, the isomorphism from blue Papa Smurf to red Papa Smurf. Okay? 
I cannot believe I just came up with that. Analogy. <laughs> it's not planned, and it's probably terrible at so many levels. But anyway, um, so so even though this kind of index y seems to be playing the same thing, this is the key distinction. When we use the metric to lower an index, we keep the same label. This is the dual vector corresponding to this vector. If we try that trick with an arbitrary tensor, we should just give it a different label because it's genuinely a different uh, object. Okay? Now, <clears throat> that being said, if we can lower indices with the metric, just looking at the indices, we should be able to alternately raise an index with the metric. So start with a dual vector and use the, well, this is not quite the metric, right? If this is the metric, this is the dual metric, but the metric is a very special tensor for many reasons. In particular, the metric enjoys the following. The dual form of the metric is exactly the inverse of the metric. We can contrast this with the dual form of an arbitrary tensor, which is generally in no way related to the inverse. So for an arbitrary second rank tensor, if you raise both of the indices, this matrix, if you represent it by a matrix, there's no reason for it to be the inverse of this matrix. But for the metric, if I raise both of its indices, this matrix is genuinely the inverse of this matrix. So the metric is just, it's special everywhere. It's like extra special, okay? Yeah, Will. That's true for all metrics? Yes, that's true for all metrics, okay? All right. <coughs> and then, uh, man, I think there's even another thing I can say. Oh yeah, here we go, this is pretty cool. So the metric, for all of its specialness, it's still, at heart, a second rank tensor. And as a second rank tensor, we know how it transforms, okay? So if I do a coordinate transformation on the metric, or if I do a Lorentz transformation on the metric, then it goes to a new form, which I can get through the following application of lambda matrices, okay? And if you play around with this for a while, you'll realize that this expression is essentially saying something like this, uh, minus one transpose G lambda minus one. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll show you how to, ex, ex, uh, to tease out this structure of matrix multiplication in just a minute. But um, this, this looks familiar, right? In fact, let me do one of those things that we like to do when, when inverses appear and we want to get rid of them. Let's apply lambda inverse transpose to the left. Or sorry, let's apply let's sorry, let's apply lambda. Wait a minute, hold on, I'm confusing myself. Let me apply oh sorry, lambda transpose. Let me apply lambda transpose to the left. If I apply lambda transpose to the left, then on this side I have lambda transpose g prime. But when I apply lambda, lambda transpose to this, it just cancels this guy. And then I'm going to apply lambda from the right, and that just cancels this guy, so I get an expression that looks like that. Now, does that look familiar to anybody? Matthew Kowalski, what is that telling you? That's. Um, yeah, this is actually how we find the transformations given a metric that carries us from vectors to dual vectors or a representation to a dual re representation in a group. And in that case, we actually wrote down the following. We said lambda transpose G lambda is equal to G. Okay? So this is just sort of a technical manipulation. Here's the bottom line, the important thing. Notice, in going from here to here, what I'm actually saying is that G is equal to G prime. That is, yes, the metric is a second rank tensor, so if I do a Lorentz transformation, it transforms in this way, 
However, the Lorentz transformations are the very special set of transformations such that when you transform the metric, you get back exactly what you started with. Those are called isometries of the metric. They are symmetries of that metric. They do not change its form. In this class, it's not really worth diving into because we're only going to deal with one metric, minus one, 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 and the only transformations we're going to think about are isometries. But in general relativity, you think about arbitrary metrics and arbitrary transformations, and then finding the ones that are isometries is actually an interesting exercise, which brings in that really cool name. Killings equation. I know. All right. So anyway, so just that's another observation about uh, uh, metrics. And then um, special to this course, because we're always going to be dealing with the Minkowski metric, is an observation that since our metric is actually just minus 1, 1, 1, our metric enjoys a nice property that the components of the inverse metric are actually the same. So if I give you this matrix and say is that the metric or the inverse metric, it's actually a little confusing, right? Because they have the same components. That's not true in general. For you know spherical polar coordinates or the Schwarzschild geometry, the metric and the inverse metric have different components. So I just want to point out special cases when, when they arise. And there's lots and lots of special cases in four dimensions. If you haven't figured it out, learn, your learning of physics is entirely handicapped by the fact that everything's four dimensional. Because there are so many degeneracies, four, four dimensional flat space. There are so many degeneracies in that case that you just, you can't really see what's going on. And we'll figure out why more examples of this later on. Yes? Can you construct a tensor that's not the metric that also has the property that it's dual is the inverse? Sure. That it's dual, oh, oh, that it's dual is the inverse. No. No. No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think so. You could pick a specific transformation and maybe write down another tensor which under that, tra that specific transformation, the Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 we're, we're, we're mixing, mixing questions. You're saying write down a second rank tensor whose dual uh, Yeah, uh, maybe possibly for flat space. Maybe because everything is so degenerate in flat space, you might could do it. Um, but I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. I'd have to think about it. Different tensor if you just move the name Say it again? Um like move the negative down here yeah. as opposed to there? Mm, yeah, that's a different tensor. That's certainly not the metric tensor anymore. Okay. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could probably come up with an example. Uh, yeah, possibly. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it would correspond to this isomorphism, this unique isomorphism between vectors and their dual vectors, but I'd have to think about that. Uh, normally I'd stay away from statements which are very specific to flat space because underlying all of this is the truth of general relativity. <laughs> so you don't want to learn too many things that are only true in special relativity when you can go beyond it. Um, okay, at the, at the risk of not getting finished, you're cut off. Put your hand down. <laughs> uh, let, me, let, me, let me make another statement about uh, these indexed objects. Um, before I get lost in this. So there's, there's one other kind of object that I've been writing down that has indices. And it's not a tensor and it's certainly not the metric tensor. Does anybody know what it is? Okay. It's the lambdas, yeah. I've been writing a bunch of these things. Okay, it's important, and, and especially if it's your first time dealing with this, like you see, oh, that's got indices, that's got indices, they're kind of the same thing, no. These are not tensors. In fact, these are the only objects we ever write down that have both unprimed and primed indices. Notice, tensors always have all their indices primed or unprimed. We don't mix them, okay? The reason these have primed and unprimed indices is because they are the things that take us from the unprimed coordinates to the primed coordinates. They are the connection between two sets of coordinates. Okay, 
These are the transformations. These are the group elements. These are the things you're acting on. Okay? In particular, it brings a small tear to my eye whenever I see a student trying to work out the transformation properties of the lambdas. <laughs> because you would never transform a transformation. Okay? We don't, these aren't tensors, they don't have transformation laws. These are the transformations themselves. Okay? <coughs> Um, all right, and I'll say a couple more words about about those transformation matrices and how you represent them as well, I'm going to do it right now as as, as matrices. Okay, so um, any yes, Wolfgang. Uh, is there any meaning to tensors that have a upper index and a lower index? So a tensor like uh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's here's one. Um, So does anybody know what that is? Four. Nope. What is that? So what kind of object is it? It's a 1-1 one, one tensor because the new would disappear. It has one lower and one upper index. So it's a 1-1 one, one tensor. It can be represented by a matrix because it's got two indices. You might know what matrix would represent this. It's just the identity. Which you could get by writing these two matrices, two metrics and multiplying them together. Well, a metric and an inverse metric, okay? However, what if I did this? Four. That's four. Because this would say, this would say make, actually we could do it this way, this would say first make this matrix, but then after I've made this matrix, take the, the, the column index and make it the same as the row index, and then sum over them. So you're really just summing over the diagonals, and this is how we define the trace of the metric. Okay, which is weird if you think about it, because if I gave you the metric and said trace that, you'd probably say two. But that's not how we define the trace. Okay, we define the trace this way. Okay, so again, a lot of these little details, as you work through the homework and get some familiarity with examples of this, these will uh, hopefully be brought more to light, but um, that's a little difficult. So that's a, so the identity is a mixed tensor, and there, there are a lot of other things. The Riemann tensor in general relativity was a mixed tensor. It was a 1-3 tensor. So, okay, all right. Um, other questions about this stuff before we move on? All right. So um, for the index notation thing, uh, I want to just do one really, really super concrete example because um, I'm going to ask you to work some out in the homework, but I feel like you might need a little bit of guidance in how that works. So I'm, I'm very quickly going to go through a very familiar and very concrete example of using index notation. So let's just use index notation to rotate a two-dimensional vector. Okay, something you're all very comfortable and familiar with. So here we go. I'm going to consider a little vector of coordinate differentials, dx, dy. I'm just working in good old Euclidean space, so x, y, everything is spatial. And then I know that I can affect the rotation with a rotation matrix. So using matrices, I can write uh, cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, dx dy, and then if I do my matrix multiplication, I just have cosine theta dy plus sine theta dx, and minus sine theta dx plus cosine theta dy, and that is just the new dx prime dy prime coordinate differentials. And by the way, if it, I might have been moving the minus sign here up here in the previous lecture. That's really the difference between passive and active rotation, so you're all aware if you have a coordinate system and you have a vector v, if you rotate the vector v by theta in that direction, <laughs> then, then you affect the rotation of this vector by... I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know. Just pull it. 
He can't get in the room. He's not strong enough. <laughs> okay. If you rotate a vector V by an angle theta, then you use this matrix to transform the components of the vector. However, what we're doing and what you actually do in, in, for example, general relativity is you rotate the coordinate system by an angle theta. And if you rotate the coordinate system, you can just actually write down what it looks like, but you use the matrix of that form. Yeah? Did you mix up the multiplication matrix multiplication off the top? Uh, it's entirely possible. Uh, yeah. No, I totally, yeah, what, what's up with that? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's super nice. Okay, so if I'll endeavor to always write it with the minus sign down here, but if I forget, just feel free to correct me. But has everybody seen passive versus, or active versus passive rotations? We're going to be dealing with coordinate transformations, so we're never going to do Hey, Vance, how you doing? <laughs> Sorry, I, my finger just like got... Oh, that's okay. <laughs> anyway, right, no respect from that guy. So, <laughs> so all right, so there's a, there's a coordinate transformation as you're familiar with doing it. Now I just very quickly want to bang out what it looks like in index notation. So here we go. Um, if I wanted to write down the matrix which carries me from the old coordinates to the new coordinates, it would of course just be that matrix. But if I explore that for a moment and look at the actual identification of the elements, then I would have that lambda 1 prime 1 is cosine theta, lambda 1 prime 2 is sine theta, lambda 2 prime 1 is minus sine theta, and then, of course, lambda 2 prime 2 is cosine theta. So let me give you an idea of how I'm discerning this. The leftmost index I'm using to label the row, and the rightmost index I'm using to label the column. My mnemonic is always RC circuits. The E is what you want. So the first row, first column is obviously cosine theta. First row, second column is sine theta, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, with that in mind, if I want to transform the vector dx mu to the form in the new coordinates, I would just say lambda mu prime mu dx mu, and then I would say, okay, that's lambda mu prime uh, 1 dx1 plus lambda mu prime 2 dx2, because when I do the transformation, I get a common index that has to be summed. So I just put in both allowed values, and now what I can say is that d1 prime, so I'm going to put in a 1 there, is lambda 1 prime 1 dx1 plus lambda 1 prime 2 dx2. I'm just putting in the 1 there, the 1 there, the 1 there, okay? And similarly for dx2 prime, And now just take a moment. If you actually take these prescriptions for the lambda elements and put them into these expressions, you're going to get exactly this. Okay? So this is index notation giving you exactly what you get from matrix manipulations. Okay? The good thing though about matrix manipulate or, or sorry, index notation is that you're going to get exactly the same result even if you write it this way. <coughs> there is going to be zero difference if you switch the order of these two things when you evaluate it this way. Evaluating it this way is not going to afford you that flexibility. Okay? So the idea that we don't have to worry about order when we use index notation is something I talked about last time. Um, it's an advantage over matrix manipulations. Now, you might say, well, why would we ever use matrices? Well, the truth is, this is really cumbersome to do by hand, especially when you're talking about like four by four things. It's really tedious. Matrix multiplication is actually incredibly efficient for humans to do, all right? Now, bear in mind, ma Mathematica or whatever programming thing you're having doing your matrix multiplication is secretly doing index notation. It doesn't know anything about matrices. It just knows about indexed arrays of numbers and rules for combining them and it's just index notation, okay? But humans can actually do matrix manipulations pretty efficiently. 
Now, again, you can't always force something into a matrix equation. So for the most part, we should just abandon it. But there are going to be times when you're going to want to do it. And so you have to be careful, right? So in particular, if you start with an expression in index notation and you want to beat it into matrix form, here are the rules that you have to be very careful about. Um, to transition, transfer summations over indices into matrix manipulations, the summed indices must be what? I know that there are people who took GR who knows this. They must be adjacent, immediately adjacent to each other. Okay, so let's look at this example. In this expression, the mu is what is summed and it's the right index on this and it's the only index on this. So they're immediately adjacent. So that means that if I had the matrix for this, and the vector form of this, I can literally multiply this matrix by this vector and everything will be fine. However, here, the mu is separated from the mu by this guy. So if I tried to put a vector, a column vector there and a matrix here, the matrix operation doesn't work, okay? And the same goes if, you know, we have T mu nu, M mu, actually M lambda mu, We'll do this first, okay? If I wanted to do this with matrix multiplication, the mu's have to be adjacent, so I can just switch the order because the order doesn't matter here, and so I can write this as m lambda mu t mu nu, and then I can put in the matrix for this, the matrix for that, and make, use matrix multiplication, okay? Where it gets tricky is if I ask you to evaluate this. What would you do to that? Transpose. Yeah, you would transpose one of them. So it doesn't matter which one. So you could transpose T and multiply by M, or you could transpose M and multiply by T. But transposing this gets the mu to the right, and, and then you can combine it with that. Okay. So, and, and if you go back and look at your notes from last lecture, I wrote all these transformations with all these lambda, lambda, inverse, transpose crap. If you go and look through all those expressions, you'll realize what I was doing. And, and by the way, just to, just to sort of complete that story, um, if we have a transformation, a, a Lorenz transformation, that goes from the unprimed to the primed coordinate system, and I represent this by a matrix lambda, then here's a couple of rules for how we can use the lambda matrices to do transformations, okay? So we've already said, if I encounter that, then Connor, Matsky, where are you? There you are. Uh, what, what, how is the matrix for this related to this matrix? Inverse. It's the inverse, exactly. Because if this takes me from mu to mu prime, and this takes me from mu prime back to mu, that's what the inverse is. Brichel, what would this be? He's doing the dance. So, so if I compare this one to this one, what have I done? Isn't the inverse transform? It's actually it's it's just the transpose. I literally took the left and right and swapped them. The prime is still up, and the unprime is down. So if I think of this as the row and this is the column, I've literally put the, the column from here for the row here and the row here to the column there. So this would be lambda transpose, and then the last combination would be lambda mu prime mu, and that would be <laughs> lambda inverse transpose, yeah. All right. Is there anybody that, yeah? Uh, so how would the transpose look on that T? Um, we have two um, 
On this one? Yeah, to, to the subscripts, how would that change? Like, would they both become um, in the exponent, or would they stay, or would the, they switch orders? So transposing is literally taking left and right and switching them, but not moving anything up or down. So, so for example, here, when I transpose, all I do is I take the mu prime and shove it to the right, and take the mu and shove it to the left. Oh, okay. So I'm not I'm not switching up and down when I go from here to here. So in the case of the T, the the mu and the mu would just switch spots. Yeah. Okay. What if we're talking about tensors that have uh, like three or four? Oh know, well, then you're probably then you're matrix. often screwed anyway because you can't represent them as matrices. <laughs> yeah, I'm literally this is all only relevant if you want to write things as matrices. If you never ever want to do that, you don't even have to pay attention to this part unless you could just sleep. Okay. But I mean, the first time I ask you to do this, right here, and evaluate it with index notation, you're going to be like, I want a matrix so bad. Because it's horrible. <laughs> oh. OK, all right. So any other questions about this before I briskly accelerate us on your hand? You're doing that thing. I don't know whether to, you're, you're... <laughs> go ahead, ask your question. So I mean, does, it, does, matrix, does matrix, uh, matrix operations also fail when you have to do things like the track of the matrix with the tool again? Or not matrix, but a tensor with the tool? Because I'm pretty sure tensor times a tool, if they're matrices, we get to another matrix, but then in reality it's supposed to be a scalar. Right? Sure, sure, yeah. No, we've got to be really careful. Like, so this I can represent um, by a matrix, but you know, how would I do this with matrix manipulation? This is not just the multiplication of two matrices. This is actually the multiplication of two matrices followed by a trace or a sum over the diagonal. So you've got to be really careful about figuring out what the corresponding matrix manipulation is. It's not always just multiply matrices. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. But then, so then when you have like the, the metric, um, so you have the metric you multiply by it, and then it's the trace for the metric of its own inverse set, so that that's four? Uh-huh. So, metric times its inverse is four? No, 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 no. That, so the metric times, if you're using the word times to think of matrix multiplication, the metric times its inverse looks like that. But that's another matrix. The thing that I said was equal to four was the metric fully contracted with the inverse metric, which is something that has no indices left over, which should just be a number. Okay, so, and th this is more than just matrix multiplication, obviously, because the matrices disappear. All right? It's, I, I, look, there's a certain level at which until you actually have to work with specific values, you're always better off just thinking in terms of indices because it's much more transparent. You know, it's just there's so going to be some occasions where matrix manipulations are useful. And I say all this, and I should go ahead and just warn you, we are going to encounter a type of quantity in this class which we use matrix manipulations for and not index notation. And so we are going to have to keep in mind order eventually, and that is when we come to dealing with spinners. Because in this class, at least, we are not going to work with indexed spinners. But we'll jump off that bridge when we come to it. Okay, so um, here's an interesting uh, property of four-dimensional space-time, which you might or might not have seen in your previous treatments of relativity. Um, but we know that in 3D, if I take, um, if I take a infinitesimal coordinate displacement and dot it with itself, <laughs> really? Is it that interesting? Um, then I get an expression that looks like this. Whereas in 4D, we've learned that the corresponding expression looks like this. And because when we include time, the metric has that funny minus sign, and so the time component comes in with a negative. And this gives us some interesting behavior, or some interesting differences. So for example, up here, we can say that this is equal to zero only if uh, dxi equals zero if all of the coordinate differentials equal zero identically. And that's just a familiar statement that if you have a vector 
its length is only zero when that vector is the zero vector. Okay? Here though, because of this lovely minus sign, that's not at all the case. This can equal zero even when dx mu does not equal zero. In fact, this can be, uh, it can be greater than zero or it can be less than zero. There's nothing that says that this quantity has to be positive. Here, this has to be positive, right? The length of the vector is a positive quantity. Here though, because of this minus sign, this combination could end up being negative for certain dx mu's. Okay, now, an important observation is that this thing is what kind of tensor? Zero, zero. It's a zero, zero tensor, it's a scalar. It has no indices. So that means if I change coordinates, how would the value of this change? It shouldn't. But changing coordinates is equivalent to changing observers. So to all observers, the value of ds squared should never appear differently. But what that means is that we can take ds squared and we can break it up into three categories. The ds squareds which are positive, the ones which are zero, and the ones which are negative. And if one observer sees a ds squared that's positive, they all will. Similarly for equal to zero and less than zero. All right, now what's interesting about this is that we can actually tie the sign of ds squared to how fast something is moving. So if we, for example, consider something which is only moving along the x-axis, so in, in y and z it's just sitting still, in order for this to be positive, I need minus c squared dt squared plus dx squared to be positive. And then of course here, minus ct squared plus dt, or dt squared dx squared is zero, minus c squared dt squared plus dx squared is less than zero. But now all I have to do is move each of these to the other side of the equality or the inequality, and then divide the dt into both sides, and what I find in this case is that, oh, yeah, I know, I better, I better be careful, I'm going to confuse the living crap out of myself. Uh, yes, in this case, oh, this is going to make me mad, so dx dt is greater than c, yeah. dx dt is equal to c, and dx dt is less than c. Okay? Clearly in this case, this is something traveling faster than the speed of light, something traveling at the speed of light, and something traveling subliminally. Which one do we tend to enjoy? This one. Particles that we describe in this class, unless they're massless, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, particles in this class should always be enjoying ds squareds, which are negative, okay? Massless particles should be enjoying ds squareds, which are equal to zero, and we should not be talking about anything that enjoys this, except for the fact that we will. <laughs> okay? But it will, it will be in a very weird context that you weren't expecting, okay? On a, C, on a, on a, a space-time diagram where we plot x versus ct, the 45 degree line is actually the line traveling, the line of something traveling along the speed of light because the slope is c. And so two points in that space time separated along that line would be enjoying this property. Two points at different positions at the same instant of time would be enjoying this property. But we know to get from one point in space to another point in space in zero time requires traveling faster than the speed of light. It's instantaneous travel. And then points which rest at the same instant of position, or the same position but just move in time, they enjoy this property, which is of course something we know that massive particles can do like us. We can sit still. Okay, and you don't have to be at these three cases. You know, you could be this and this and all over the place. But. Okay.
So I just make that simple observation because that's going to play a role in a few minutes when we try and talk about velocities. Any questions? You guys good? Okay, so th this, is, this is a very important observation that we'll come back to in just a few minutes. Massive particles, things that travel less than the speed of light, their ds squareds are typically negative. Or they, they're always negative. And, and nothing can change this, right? You can't boost to a different frame and see a different sign because this is an invariant. We all agree on it. Okay, so um, one of the very useful things that we do in, in physics, relativistic or otherwise, um, is we take derivatives. And one of the reasons this is important, this is, important is because physics is... The interesting physics is a study of how things change, trying to explain why things evolve in the way that they do. Okay? Well, the mathematical description of change is the derivative, right? It's telling you how things are changing, be it a change in time or as, as it changes from one position to another. Okay? Perfectly static, derivative free physics is boring. Okay? So one of the things we need to do when we relativize uh, our physics is to talk about relativistic versions of derivatives. And of course, one derivative, or we have two derivatives that we see quite often in uh, non-relativistic physics. We have the, <coughs> the del, which we can apply to a scalar uh, affecting the gradient operation, or we can take it and we can dot it with some vector, in which case we're looking at the divergence. We can also cross it with something to create the curl, although the curl is something which we're not so, we're not going to worry so much about in this class, so I won't worry about writing it for now. Um, but another derivative which is rather useful in physics is talking about how something varies with time. And in fact, perhaps I should say, d by dt. Okay, so you're all familiar with del. You've seen it in different coordinate systems. In Cartesian coordinates, it's just d by dx, i hat plus d by dyj hat plus d by dz k hat. But you've also probably seen it in spherical polar coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, hyperbolic toroidal coordinates. <laughs> I made that last one up. Anyway, uh, and then you're all familiar with d by dt. This is something you saw as early as physics one or in your calculus class, your first calculus class. Okay. Well, both of these need to get relativistic generalizations. So if we think about it, the naive thing to do is say, well, this is space and this is time. Relativity is space, time, boom! <laughs> Let's just stick them together. Let's make this. Yeah! <laughs> I don't really know what that is, but you know, I mean, maybe we could formalize it like d, d by dx i hat plus dot 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 plus d by dt. Okay, now maybe that should be a partial uh, t hat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, so um, we are going to do something like this. All right. Well, actually, I'm just going to do it now. But we're also going to have to reckon with a, a different derivative. So we're going to replace the gradient operation <coughs> with a four-component generalization, but we're also going to come back and find just a simple generalization of a planar time derivative. Um, and I'll explain why we need that in a minute. But for, this, for, for now, let's talk about the generalization of the gradient. So uh, <coughs> the gradient is actually pretty straightforward to generalize. We typically call it d lower mu, and that's code for d by dx mu. And this might look a little wonky because the mu is up here and it's down here, but this is in the denominator, so bam, that makes sense. <laughs> and this is literally just the set of d by dct, d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. You might have noticed, the astute observer might have noticed that I wrote this as a row matrix. Why in the world would I have done that? Devin? Where's Devin? Devin! Why would I have written this as a row matrix? Um, you write out the gradient. Well, yes. This is a generalization of the gradient, so I would write it like we tend to write the gradient. But what else have we written as row matrices? Starts with a D and rhymes with dual vector. That's your hint. <laughs> <laughs> dual vector, excellent. Strong work, Devin, yes. 
This is how I usually represent dual vectors. And hey, guess what? You know, everybody see where that index is? It's down. This is, in fact, a dual vector. OK? That's why we write the index down. We like this notation better because it's very obvious. Oh, the index is down, therefore it's a dual vector. Here you've got to be like, is it up, is it down? It's a little bit of both. I don't know. <laughs> this is easier to write, too. OK? So, so the fact that it's a dual vector tells us two things. One, it tells us how it transforms. It transforms like a dual vector. And then secondly, it tells us how we would combine this with vectors. So for example, I could say d mu a mu. And then I'm just grabbing the components of this and combining with the components of this. And what the hell is this thing? Scalar. It's the scalar. So it's the four-dimensional generalization of? The divergence. Because this makes a scalar, right? So this is what we call the four divergence. What if I just took this and acted on a scalar with it? What would that be associated with? The gradient. Because here I take the del of a scalar and I get back something that you've probably horribly called a vector. But anyway. Um, here though we realize this gives us a dual vector, so this is the four gradient. But the observation is that it doesn't give us a vector, it gives us a dual vector. Did anybody ever tell you that this gives you back a dual vector? You should ask for your money back. <laughs> the gradient gives you a dual vector, not a vector. The problem, though, is, is that you're working in 3D, and in 3D, vectors and dual vectors have the same components, so you really didn't have to distinguish. I told you. Lower dimensional physics just sucks that way. Super, super degenerate. OK, so um, yeah, yeah. All right, so um, this kind of derivative is going to play a very important role, especially when we're talking about fields. When we work with field Lagrangians in the next several weeks, we're going to use this derivative extensively. Because a field, we haven't really defined it particularly. I, I think I did a kind of a pictorial definition, but a field is defined everywhere in space and time. So kind of think of it as like a surface in space time, and it might be doing interesting wiggly things. And if we want to describe how the field is changing in different directions, that's exactly what this derivative is going to measure for us. It's looking at how it changes in space and in time. Okay? So we're going to use this extensively when we talk about fields. The hand was up and then it went down. Yes? Is there a four curl or something like that? Sure, you can generalize that as well, but we're not going to do that in this case. So it's, it's not a cross product per se, but you could use the levy Civita tensor to create anti-symmetric anti contractions of this derivative <laughs> with other index quantities. But let's, 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 let's not go there right now. OK, so um, what sucks is James's picture was next. Anyway, all right. So, um, so that's all well and good. Uh, and we'll deal with that derivative a lot when we talk about field Lagrangians in the next in, in, in a bit. But there's actually another derivative that's, that's also very, very important for us. Oh my God, I have three sets and three pages of notes in 20 minutes. Um, and that is, um, a lot of our, so uh, the Lagrangians that we're going to write down are going to be field Lagrangians, which can describe a whole vast array of phenomena. But when we want to compare our calculations and predictions with experiment, Experiments are usually in working in terms of particles, tiny fluctuations, okay? And it turns out that the, the language we use to describe particle-like behavior is, is there's a sort of more efficient language we can use to describe that instead of trying to use the full description of what's going on with the field, okay? Because, I mean, particles, we have sort of intuitive notions of how to describe particles. So, for example, you know, a particle moves through space, and if I give you its position in space as a function of time, you kind of go, oh, the particle's doing this, and that's cool. You can describe the same kind, or you can tease the same kind of behavior out of a field, it's just a little more cumbersome. So we're going to use some particle-like descriptions of things, and in the context of particle-like descriptions, we know that the derivative with respect to time is a very important one because we use this to define lots of very important things. Okay? 
So we really would like to have a relativistic notion of the derivative with respect to just time. It doesn't necessarily have to bring in the spatial derivatives as well. And so we could just try, uh, you know, a naive guess. So um, if I take a coordinate differential in spatial directions and I do a coordinate differential in space time, then I know that I'm looking at dx mu. And of course, we've written the components of this a gazillion times. And so what we might guess is to create a velocity by taking dx mu dt. Okay? Why not? You know, it's kind of playing the naive game of what we did here. Okay, let's first of all see how <coughs> this is broken and then figure out how to fix it. First of all, this thing is only going to be good if it is a what? Jacob. Which? Our Wachowski, Jacob. Uh, this thing is only going to be a useful velocity if it's what kind of object? A vector. Which zero is what one kind one. of object? Is it zero, one, or one, zero? Can't it's remember. a one, zero tensor. But most importantly, it needs to be a tensor. All right? But what does it mean to be a tensor, Matt Kowalski? Where are you? Got to transform like a tensor. It got to transform <laughs> like a tensor. You dance straight about that. So I need v mu to go to v v mu prime equals lambda mu prime mu v mu. I need that to happen. I need that love. Are we going to get that love? Well, if I actually put this thing right here in. And I say dx mu dt goes to dx mu prime dt prime. That's lambda mu prime mu dx mu dt. That's a crazy mu. <laughs> <laughs> this much I can say because I know that dx mu itself is a vector. So I know how dx mu transforms. It just gets a lambda. But t transforms. It's not a scalar. But what it, like what is it transformed like? It's not a scalar, it's not a vector. How the hell does T transform? Screw it, not like a tensor. Yeah, it's not it's it's actually it transforms like a component of a tensor, because after all, it is a component of this tensor. But that's not, that doesn't transform with a lambda matrix, okay? So even though the dx mu is well behaved, the dt is where we get screwed because it doesn't transform in the right way. I would have to figure out how to make this dt prime in terms of dt, but it is no simple rule, okay? So this actually suggests a route to the solution of this conundrum. And that is, Let's try to find something that we could use in place of t, which doesn't transform, which is invariant. OK? So without any further ado, here is going to be our definition of a four velocity. First of all, I'm going to pick my new t to be an invariant and I'm going to choose this. Now let's think about this for a moment. Is this invariant? Oh, yes. Hell yes. This is linear, so I gotta take a square root. Why did I put the minus there? So because for massive particles, this quantity is always negative, and so that minus will make it positive in the square root than is real, okay? This is just the path length in space-time. So if a particle is moving through space-time, this ds squared is just tracking the length of its path through space-time. That's important because it's a monotonically increasing parameter. It can't decrease. So we can use that to sort of 
parametrize the evolution of this particle's motion. And that's how we use time in non-relativistic physics. We just say, oh, time only increases as the particle moves around, so that's going to be a nice way to parametrize this motion. Well, the length of the path in space-time is also something which only increases as the particle moves. Okay. So we're going to define our four velocity as dx mu d tau. And we automatically know this is a very good tensor, perfectly good tensor. In fact, it's a vector because dx mu is a vector and this is an invariant, a scalar. So if I want to know how this transforms, too many use mu's, da, 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 da. it just transforms exactly like what we would expect for a vector. Oh, sorry, uh, I, I, I'm being a little lazy. There should be a C there. <coughs> okay. Um, why should there be a C there? There's no units on. Yeah, dx mu and d tau have the same units. And so this would be dimensionless. So if we wanted to have dimensions of velocity, we just throw in something which is invariant, and that's the speed of light c. Okay. All right. Um, so with that in mind, so, so, uh, uh, so what I've done right now is I have motivated a useful four-dimensional derivative with respect to time, where really by time what I mean is I want something I can use to parametrize motion. Okay. Now that we have a good derivative with respect to time, we use it to define a four-dimensional velocity. Okay, just by taking the derivative with respect to that thing, and this resulting four velocity truly transforms like a vector. Now that that's motivated and written down, I'm going to tease out its explicit form, and it's going to look like things that you've seen in other classes where you've looked at relativity. Well, I don't know why you keep flashing me the peace sign, but peace out, man. All right, so anyway, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> would, it be, would it be a bad idea to try and describe d tau in terms of the proper time? As in... Oh, sorry, so uh, d tau uh, is the proper time. Oh, okay. <laughs> or, or the rest time. <laughs> Which I think this gets really confusing. But um, the way you see it is d tau, which is the square root. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, man, that's crazy. I don't know what I, OK. If you're at rest, then dx, y, d, or dx, dy, and dz are all 0. If you're at rest, then those are all 0. But then this just reduces to the square root of c squared dt squared, or c dt. So in your rest frame, d tau is just your time, which is what we call the proper, or the rest time, also the proper time. I don't like that notion. I like to just think of ds squared as the length of the path in space time, and then screw who's looking at it. I don't care, because it's invariant. Yeah? If we're looking at uh, paths that were either space-like or light-like, do we have to define it differently? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so then you get into the notion of affine reparameterizations, and especially for null trajectories, because we do have lots of things moving at the speed of light, and d tau is zero for those. So you need a different parameterization. But we're not going to worry about that right now. OK, so what I want to do is, um, based on our definition, I want to tease out what are the components of this four velocity, and then hopefully make contact with things you've seen before. So here we go. Here's one of those frame pictures. I'm going to have a frame S rest where I'm, having, I'm looking at an object that's at rest in the, S prime, in the S frame. So this is the object. It's like a particle, and it's moving. Um, and what's important is that this frame moves with the object. That's how it's the rest frame of that object, because in this frame, the object is always at rest. So whatever the motion of the object is, the frame is tracking it. Now, this frame sees this frame moving with that relative motion. Of course, it also sees this particle moving with that relative motion. 
The reason I'm setting it up this way is we talk about transformations between frames, not transformation from a frame to a particle. But we can always associate a particle with a frame just by saying, I want to look at the frame where that particle is at rest. And then we can transform between these two frames. Okay, so here we go. Um, so as seen in, oh dear God, I think I wrote it wrong, in S, it's not, a, oh sorry, that's not S prime, that's just S. This has already got a label S rest, so I'll have to call this S prime. So as seen in S, um, what does the four velocity of this thing look like? Well, it's going to look like the following. So again, we're using this definition. So uh, the zero component is going to be c squared dt d tau. The one component is just going to be c dx d tau, et cetera, et cetera. c squared, because remember, dx mu is c dt dx, et cetera, et cetera. So you get an extra factor of c. Yes? Is that a dt d tau or a dx d dt d tau, dx d tau? So uh, literally, I'm plugging in the different components of dx mu and taking the derivative with respect to tau. I'm plugging this into this, and I'm looking one component at a time. OK? And uh, uh, hopefully, you can generalize this to u2 and u3. All right? So now I can do some of that annoying stuff, which is to say this is really secretly c dx dt dt d tau et cetera, et cetera. Okay, nothing wrong with that. I'm just introducing this sort of auxiliary uh, coordinate differential. But you'll notice everything now is sitting there happily with a factor of dt d tau. Um, and then we can make use of the relation that d tau squared is c squared dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared, where the pro proliferation of minus signs is because d tau was defined as the square root of minus d s squared. So to get the square of this, we have to square this, but distribute that minus sign, okay? Um, But I can take this guy and divide through by dt squared, and I find c squared minus what is basically v squared, where v is the spatial velocity. Okay, v squared here is just dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared over dt squared. That's what we usually think of as the square of the spatial velocity. Okay? Then, of course, d t d tau is just 1 over the square root of c squared minus v squared. Which we can identify as gamma over c, where gamma is the usual relativistic factor. So in these components, anywhere I see d t d tau, I can just replace it with gamma over c. And so what we find <coughs> is that this just becomes c squared, or actually, sorry, c gamma uh, uh, no, because I used it to cancel one of these c's. And then uh, this is going to be c vx, sorry, vx gamma, and then vy gamma vz gamma for u2 and u3. Okay, remember I broke this up into dx dt dt d tau. The dt d tau becomes a gamma over c, but dx dt is just the x component of the velocity. Here's an important observation because a lot of times people work out examples and they say it's only moving along the x direction. And that's fine. But if you're moving along x, y, and z, in these expressions, these are only the components of the velocity in that direction, but the gamma uses all of the velocity components, right? Because here's where I got that gamma factor, and it used all of dx, dy, dz, okay? 
All right, so without any further ado, we can now define a four momentum by uh, multiplying the four velocity by the mass, and we don't use the notion of relativistic mass in this class. Mass is just mass, that's it. We don't even call it rest mass, we just call it the mass of the particle. And if we do that, then the form of the four momentum then just becomes m times gamma times c, m times gamma times v. Okay, the spatial part is just a collection of the, these terms. Of course, you could just fashion those into a spatial velocity. <coughs> and moreover, if you evaluate this quantity in the rest frame of the particle, so if now everything I've written is in this frame where I see the particle moving, but I could just as well evaluate this in the rest frame of the particle, and in the rest frame of the particle, what is this reduced to? Say it again? That bottom one. Yeah, this bottom part is zero because in the rest frame this is zero. What about the first part? Also, it's MC. Okay? So we have a weird observation that the four momentum, even for a particle which is at rest, the four momentum vector is still not zero. Okay. Now, uh, to connect this with things that you've seen before, <coughs> um, for V over C much, much less than one, we can take gamma anywhere we see it and replace it by one plus one half V squared over C squared. Okay, remember gamma is just one over the square root of one minus V squared over C squared. So if we're moving very slow compared to the speed of light, Everywhere I see gamma, I can replace it with that. And then what we find is that the four momentum just becomes 1 over C times MC squared plus 1 half MV squared plus dot, dot, dot. And this just becomes MV. Plus dot, 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 high order terms. And now we notice something familiar. That is good old non-relativistic kinetic energy. And this is good old non-relativistic momentum. So we can see now how you get relativistic corrections to non-relativistic expressions. Okay? You just, you work with the full expression. And then if you want to peel apart the corrections, you just do this expansion and keep more terms. But here's the weird observation. The lowest order term in this guy actually comes before the classical kinetic energy term. So this rest mass term, which is the origin of this famously misunderstood e equals mc squared, horrible expression, but anyway, okay, that's what makes this really weird. This term is actually there in non-relativistic physics. It's just it's really hard to tap into it. Of course, in relativistic physics, where we've got high enough energies that things are being created and destroyed, the rest mass energy plays a very important role. It's there in non-relativistic physics. In fact, at some level, it's more important than this term. It's bigger than this term. Okay? It's just if you can't tap into it, it might as well not be there. And then, of course, we have higher order corrections. And so the typical packaging of this is to say that this is the relativistic energy and this is the relativistic spatial momentum, where this term includes all of this, and this term includes all of this. And together, these two combine to form the four momentum. Rochelle. Would maybe it be better to say E rel over C? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's, uh, yeah, I have it in my notes. I just didn't look. You're right. This should be E rel over C. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me just, I'm going to do like three more minutes because this is very relevant for your homework and we'll get, it, get you out of here. Um, but I just want to play a few tricks with this P mu because you're going to use this in your homework and it's also going to tie back to something that we were talking about a little while ago. So P mu is our four momentum and it is a vector. So then what is this? 
It's a scalar. That means that this thing has the same value to any observer. This thing is different for different frames. But this is the same for every observer. Okay? So in particular, <coughs> we can take p mu, p mu in any frame and say that it has to have the same value as what I would get if I evaluated it in the rest frame. Because this is a scalar. It's the same in all frames. But if I look at this p mu, p mu in any frame, I find minus e squared over c squared plus p squared, which is essentially the square of this. The time term gets the negative we usually get, and then you square the spatial momentum. It's the relativistic energy and momentum here, okay? But on the right, what's the right-hand side equal to? What was the four momentum in the rest frame? It was mc. So what do you get when you square it? Minus m squared c squared. Right? Again, the mc was in the time term, so when you square it, you get that minus sign. Okay. We usually turn this around into an expression of this form, e squared minus p squared, p squared c squared equals m squared c to the fourth. And this is what we call the mass shell condition. And this is a relation between relativistic energy, relativistic momentum, and mass that must be satisfied by all real particles. Not virtual particles, which we'll talk about, but all real particles have to satisfy this. Hey, here's an interesting observation. This thing is invariant. In particular, if, if I see it as positive, all observers have to see it as positive. Okay? But we can conclude that this is negative if m squared is positive. It's zero only if m squared is zero, and it's greater than zero only if m squared is less than zero. I'm just looking here. So this is p mu, p mu, <coughs> and what its sign is is determined by m squared. Okay. Well, didn't we just say earlier that if something squared is zero, it's moving at the speed of light? Didn't we say earlier that if something squared is less than zero, then it's moving slower than the speed of light? And if something squared is greater than zero, then it's moving faster than the speed of light? This is how you make the connection between the observation that massless particles move at the speed of light, massive particles must move slower, and, well, we'll learn about what the hell this is later. Okay? All right, so when you're doing your homework, um, a very useful observation. That's kind of the end of the formal stuff. Now this is just a tip for your homework. A very useful thing to realize is that when we write down energy and momentum conservation, we tend to write down the sum of all the four momenta for, say, a collision initially, and then say that's got to be equal to the final. Okay. So, you know, if I say I've got A plus B goes to C plus D, if I sum the four momentum of these, that's my P initial. If I sum the four momentum of these, that's the P final. And then conservation of energy and momentum, which holds relativistically, just says the initial is equal to the final. Here's a very important thing. These are vectors. And so these have to be specified in the same frame. Okay. In particular, I might call one of them the frame, or I call them the frame S. When you're working problems, though, there is a cheat that you can use a lot, and you will use in your homework, and that is to say, if I square the initial, and I square the final, I can do these in the same frame, and they still obviously have to be equal, right? because I'm just squaring each side of this equation. Oh. I'm literally taking this and squaring both sides. But now what kind of quantities are these? 
They're invariants. So there's no reason why these two have to be the same frame. So quite often in, co in collision problems, you'll talk about the lab frame, which is where we set up the particles, you know, being shot into an accelerator at a certain velocity. But then you want to do a lot of calculations in the center of momentum frame because that's a frame where the net spatial momentum is zero and a lot of quantities simplify. To connect those two frames, you normally have to work in terms of the squares of the four vectors because that quantity you can relate from different frames. Okay, whereas these expressions with the vectors, you always have to do in the same frame. Okay, that's it. Uh, sorry for keeping you a little bit longer, but now you're officially prepared to do your homework. And I'll see you next time. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know that.